Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 57 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron, and I'm super glad you're here. I'm in quite a good mood, which, as you know, is pretty normal most of the time. Um, but, you know, like I said last week, last month was rough, and um, we're coming out of it. It feels really good to be back in work. And if you get my uh, writer's email, you may have already heard heard about the giddiness that I have. Um, no, I didn't make like a million dollar sale, nothing like that. Something better, you guys. I cracked dictation. I have finally gotten it. Um, and basically, I'll just uh, boil it down to how it's working for me. I use an app on my phone called Easy Voice. It doesn't really matter what you use. Um, but I use Easy Voice because it can easily convert the sound file that I capture to um, a mono wave file. Um, and I just, I plot out what I'm gonna write, jot some notes. I go lie in bed, which is phenomenal because I, my whole goal in life is basically to get back in bed. So I go lie in bed and I turn on the Easy Voice app and I record my story. Yes, it does change my voice, I think, you know. Um, it's more conversational. It's a little bit easier. It requires a lot more revision. I will say that. However, I'm the revision queen. There's nothing I like to do more than revise. So um, basically what I do is I send that WAV file, that recording, to drag and dictate and transcribe it. So I'm never sitting or standing in front of the computer, talking to the computer, watching the cursor move across the screen, watching errors land, because that's what happens when you're doing dictation or transcription. Um, what happens when you see an error land on the page in front of you is you get taken right out of the creative mode of your brain, at least I do, and put right into the editor's seat again. So that is why dictation has been so frustrating to me in the past, um, is that I kept getting yanked out of composer into editor. So this way has really allowed me to shut that part of my brain off. And when I'm lying in bed or sitting in my car office, which has been fun, um, talking to my phone, I can't see anything. I can't see those errors later when they show up in the transcription. I can fix them because then I'm in editing mode. And I swear to God, um, last week I got so many words done. It was either 15 or 20,000. I can't remember. Um, which isn't, you know, a huge deal. I used to be able to produce that consistently. And then the last couple of months happened and I haven't been. So it felt really good to get my hands back in deep, getting lots and lots of words, lots of revision, um, lots of awesomeness. I have cracked the spine of the book I'm working on. I just figured out yesterday how this thriller is going to end basically as I am at the end. So that was such a relief, um, which is good because the world is kind of rough right now. So, um, especially to those of you in America, it's rough. Hold on to your lovies, like gather the people up that you love, talk to the people that you need to talk to. Um, I have never minded making my show political and, um, let's just say for the record, Trump is an asshole of the first order. Uh, all this white supremacy bull crap. Um, especially we white people, I just really, uh, want to say, talk to your white friends about this, talk about the white privilege that we all have in this systemically racist society. Uh, if I'm losing you as a listener, see ya, um, feel free to send me an email, which I will delete. Um, but this is a conversation that needs to be had. So, um, I guess... I'm just saying I'm really glad that I had a good week writing because that helped while looking at the news. I'm also going to pull in some of the news. There's um, some racial stuff in the thriller and I'm actually going to make it a little bit, the, the clash between like the white supremacists and the Antifa a little bit stronger. And actually that's helping contribute to this culminating final scene in the book, which actually feels very good. I'm kind of fighting this fictional battle over here um, while I prepare to go out and march, um, when those efforts come to town on August 27th. So, uh, which leads me to bail money. 
I need some. Um, no, I, actually, I really hope that I don't need any bail money. I do have some bail money lined up. I have a wonderful friend um, who has actually been on the show, who I will not name, but um, uh, she's got kids and can't get arrested. Um, so she has actually uh, said that she will bail me out, and I know she actually means it. So, um, But on this topic of money, I would like to say thank some new Patreon subscribers. Thanks, you guys. It means the world. Um, Miranda Jarno. I'm assuming you pronounce it like that. What a beautiful name, no matter how you pronounce it. JD Lady, hello. And Amanda Wolf, thank you so much. Um, They are new pledges to the Patreon. And I would like to talk just for a minute. If I haven't already lost you at the racist stuff, maybe I'll lose you here, but I hope I don't. Please keep listening. Um, Speaking of Patreon, I would love it if you are listening to this show. uh, If you considered sponsoring my Patreon at patreon.com slash Rachel for one dollar an essay one dollar an essay one dollar a month is probably something maybe that you wouldn't miss too much um the wonderful thing about dollar pledges i've realized recently people have told me that they feel weird about giving a dollar pledge because it's like well that's just a dollar how can that possibly help you i can't tell you how much it helps the more little one dollar pledges I have the more stable that income is for writing these essays, which I so dearly love to write. Um, They mean so much to me. And that means as people drop in and out of patronage, as people do, which is completely fine and natural, all those $1 just kind of buffer it. So if you've ever considered just giving $1 but felt weird about it, um, I'd really love it. I think I told you last week about how I turned down that uh, subject matter expert job in order to write more. Well, since I've done that, I've been terrified. I got a huge um, medical bill, which turned out a $4,000 medical bill out of the blue, uh, which turned out to be accidental. But it was just this strike of fear into my heart. And for like five days before I managed to make the phone call to find out that it was accidental, they just forgot to bill a portion of something. I will still continue to provide this podcast free forever to you, free forever forever. Um, because I love doing this and I love talking to you guys. If it is, however, something you have considered, um, if you wanted to go over to Patreon and do that, that would be phenomenal. Uh, the most popular level is the $3 level where I send you texts all week of encouragement, usually two to three times a week. You can text back. I'll text you back after that. It's super fun. Um, what I do with the people that are in that group, um, and to sweeten the pot a little bit, I'm just going to give you an essay right now. And... What does that mean? This is actually the first essay in the collection. It's a collection of essays about creativity. As a Patreon subscriber, you get the book at the end uh, when the book is complete, and you also get each essay as it is written. There are already seven up there. Um, If you pledged $1, you could get all seven essays. But I'm going to give you a full one today. It is an MP3 recording of um, this essay that I made for another podcast, so it'll sound a little bit different, but uh, I hope you enjoy it. I really loved writing this one. It is about how we as artists are thieves. We are liars. Um, We really lie, cheat, and steal. And I delve down into um, the history of my lying and how I use it in my work now. I hope that you enjoy this essay. So I will let you go listen. Thanks you guys for listening. Thanks for being such amazing supporters. I have the best listenership in the world and I am so lucky to be doing this here with you. Okay, enjoy. Welcome. I'm Rachel Heron, the author of more than 15 books from memoir to mainstream fiction to feminist romance. And right now, I'm writing essays about creativity. I call them creativity field notes, and in them, I examine what it means to be a creative person. I encourage you, I tell you stories, and I talk about that innate energy inside you that makes you want to be a person who makes things, all kinds of things. That is some pretty special magic you've got right there. Liars and Thieves I was six the first time I told a whopper big enough to make me feel creative enough to believe it myself. I was in love with a precious antique ruby ring, and the fact it didn't belong to me didn't matter. I knew that if I had it on my hand, I'd be beautiful. 
I'd be poised and smart and kind and probably rich enough to own a horse. The ring would fix me. I gave that ring a lot of power. Many people do this with rings you might have heard. But wanting it gave me power too. I learned what it is to lie. There's a bad kind of lying, and you know what that is without me telling you. As humans, we need authenticity in our relationships, and we can only have that if we come to each other honestly as whole and imperfect beings. The lying I'm going to advocate to you is way more fun. I'm talking about creatively twisting our truth until it rings out the junk and the water runs clear. See, we need bravery to get started on something important and creative and big and exciting and scary. But old-fashioned courage is expensive and comes gift-boxed with the potential for embarrassment. Lying, used as a benevolent assistant, helps. The bravery we need to start a project can be birthed from a blatant, outright falsehood that we tell ourselves. A lie so big and audacious, our grandmothers would have smacked us on our bottoms as we ran past her. You lie on purpose to get yourself to the place you want to be, to the place you should be. I am a writer. I am a painter. I am going to run a successful small business from my living room. I will learn to sing. I am a weaver. We could call this kind of lie an affirmation, but then we risk injury from eye rolling from those around us. Let's think of it more as a stimulus, a catalyst. I'm thinking about lying because I'm working on a first draft of a novel right now, and even to say I'm writing a book sounds like a whopper. I hate first drafts. They're messy. I'm unsure about everything, and I'm convinced that this time, finally, will be the time I'm found out as an imposter. I'll get to the end of this draft and have nothing on the page that's salvageable. This novel will be the book in which I fail. It's just fear, of course. I know that. This dread reminds me of being tired. When I'm this tired, I can feel it inside my skin, dragging against my bones. People tell me I look exhausted, my feet scrape on the sidewalk, and my ideas are crap, every single one of them. But knowing I'm tired doesn't help me push back the tears that spring to my eyes while trying to do something as simple as unlock the front door with a poorly made duplicate key, a thing I struggle with every day on a regular basis, a thing that isn't usually a big deal. But exhaustion makes this the day I will finally punch the door right in its square-jawed, iron-gated gob. The fear I carry in my head and my body about starting a project feels the same way. I can feel it there, a tightly rolled piece of terror, driven deep in my soul, wedged somewhere between my aching stomach and my tremulous heart. Knowing it's fear doesn't help much. I'm writing a whole book. How dare I? How dare anyone? The English language contains about a million words. That sounds like a lot until you do some math. I've written more than a million words just on Twitter. True, I write a lot, and I do love Twitter. But still, I'm going to try and take a language that is used all the time, all over the world, and I'm going to fold and bend it into something unusual and startling and new. Who do I think I am? Where do I even start? I start with a lie. A big one. A brazen one. I'm going to write a book. No matter how many times your brain mocks you for this lie, and no matter how certain you are that you are wrong, you keep telling yourself the lie upon which you'll base your creativity for the next few hours or days or years. I'm going to write a screenplay. I'm going to learn to sew. I'm going to pick up woodworking. That right there, that's a strong formula for forward motion. I'm going to fill in the blank. You know what's even stronger? Drop the planning. Dump the going to. I'm blanking a blank. I'm writing a book. I'm making a dress by hand. I'm knitting a whole sweater. I'm making my life from scratch. We say it until it's true. Last year, when I was learning how to draw, I dove into the book Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. It teaches five concrete methods to trick the analytical left hemisphere of the brain into getting out of the way of the more creative and artistic right hemisphere. The tricks work, and if you think you can't draw, I'd encourage you to try it out. It's basically like learning to read. You learn how, and then you can. 
I got better at drawing quickly. I impressed friends. I showed off to people on Instagram. And then capriciously, I abruptly gave up drawing for hand sewing, barely giving my abandoned pencils a second thought. This personal experiment illustrated the plasticity of the brain, of my brain in particular. I could almost feel the right side of my brain flexing its newfound powers. Sure, it was used to being creative writing-wise, but there's that whole first draft birthing pain that I have. A really creative person, I thought, would sit at her desk and laugh delightedly as the stories wove themselves around her. I assumed because A, I love revision, and B, I adore math and Excel spreadsheets and totting up columns of everything from our budget to yards of stashed yarn, that I wasn't actually that creative. I was just good at being a fake creative person, while really my left brain ruled my personal roost. Even my drawing experiment seemed to echo this. I had learned the rules, and that made me able to draw exponentially better than I ever had before. I'd read a how-to book for art dummies, and the grand finale of accomplishment felt like a left-brained gimmick. It didn't make me creative. It made me good at following directions. I'd never be truly creative until I learned how to tap right into the patchouli-wearing right side of my brain. Or so I thought. It turns out that people aren't actually left or right-brained, according to a study published in 2013. It's a myth. While the brain does use different sides of the brain to accomplish certain activities and functions, there is no one strict governing side. Our brains flicker into action depending on the action itself. If you're a chicken picking corn from gravel, you can keep one eye on the gravel using creativity to get the most corn into your gullet, while at the same time another eye and the other side of your analytical brain scans the skies for predators, calculating risk. You live longer if you can do this as a chicken and as a person in Costco eating samples while avoiding other shoppers' massive carts. Our brains are made to move between the spatially aware, artistic right side and language-using analytic left side. And even more interesting is this. Going from a task that hangs out on one side can make you better at the next different task. Lying can make you more creative. Listen to that again. Quite literally, being dishonest can increase your cognitive flexibility. A recent study published in Psychological Science proposes that dishonesty and creative behavior are connected and both involve breaking rules. It's been found that it works both ways. People who are asked to lie for a study then do better in tests of creativity and people who are asked to perform creatively are more willing to lie immediately afterward. To examine the link, the researchers set up a test on which subjects were allowed and even encouraged to cheat. In a subsequent and supposedly unrelated task, the participants were presented with sets of three words like sore, shoulder, sweat, and were asked to come up with a fourth word, for example, cold, that was related to each word in the set. The task, which taps a person's ability to identify words that are so-called remote associates, is commonly used to measure creative thinking. Cheaters on the first test figured out more of the remote associates than the ones who didn't cheat. They were more open to drawing outside the lines, to feeling around outside the box. The study proposes that the ability to be creative, combined with the motivation to think outside the box, explains the proposed relationship between creative thinking and dishonesty. According to the study, the connection between lying and creativity is due to the heightened feeling of being unconstrained by rules. You felt it, right? I know I have, that heady rush of power that comes with telling a lie and being believed. Parents, since the beginning of time, have seen it. The child lies and then, excited, lies some more. Obviously, one wrong equals more wrongs. Or is it possible that the first lie broadens creativity? That a single lie leads to enhanced creativity? It was true in my case. My first big lie changed my life. 
Like a magpie, I was drawn to my mother's jewelry box. She didn't have big ticket items. There were no blingy diamond rings or tennis bracelets. She owned mostly chunky, cheap turquoise necklaces, broken brooches, and old powa hair combs. She did have some family rings, though, kept in a separate section of the jewelry box, and one of them called to me in dulcet, intoxicating tones. Edwardian in shape, its small ruby winked at me, flanked on either side by a cheerful diamond chip. The gold was yellower than my sister's hair. I coveted the ring. Of course, I was only six, so it didn't fit me. And I knew we were not to go into the bureau drawer where mom kept her jewelry box without her being with us. But I wanted that ring. So I stole it. I slipped it on. This ring is mine. I can't remember where I hid it, but it was somewhere safe. I can imagine I tucked it behind my stack of coloring books, or maybe I hid it behind the loose eye on my favorite stuffed raccoon. I thought mom would never know. The next morning, my parents called a family meeting. My sisters and I sat on the floor in a circle on the kitchen floor. The refrigerator hummed. The year before, Christy had accidentally loosed a terrified field mouse in the kitchen. It was possible the loss was my fault, as I demanded she open her hand to prove she had actually caught one outside. And I had a theory it still lived under the stove, warm and cozy in its small, fuzzy nest. Someone stole my ruby ring, said Mom, with no warm-up. I was gobsmacked. I thought I'd left no trace. Looking back, I'm sure I probably left the drawer half open and smeared with peanut butter, but at the time it had seemed like she was God, omniscient and omnipotent. Rachel, was it you? No! I was quick with the lie, but it glowed in my mouth. I was sure they could see it there, a bright neon green. There was no one else to blame but Christy, but I was only a little bit sorry that the blame would be pinned on her. I'd help her out, I thought, with whatever punishment she was meted. Christy, was it you? My sister's eyes were huge and frightened. No! Oh, man, my spirits rose. This was good stuff. If I didn't tell them the truth, they would never have proof. I would remain blameless. This was something, all right. It was power. My chest inflated, and I felt strong enough to lift the stove with one hand to search under it for the field mouse. Are you sure? Christy squeaked and nodded. The drunken, powerful feeling grew in its intensity. I just had to keep the ring hidden, that was all. A sadness that felt like a stomach ache filled me. I wouldn't be able to wear the ring until I grew up, until I was out of the house, out from under Mom's watchful, mistrusting eye. Fine, said Mom. She looked disappointed, but really, I was the one disappointed in her. Maybe if she'd believed in me in the first place, I wouldn't have turned to a life of crime. It was probably a burglar, I said, and my tongue buzzed. The bathroom window was open the other day. He probably came in that way. Mom didn't even look at me. She slapped her hands on her crossed legs and leaned forward. Okay, then, here's how it's going to go. Dad shifted uncomfortably. He always played good cop, but in this situation, the crime was too dire. He remained quiet. That ring was taken by one of you. But the burglar... Her look was a superheated laser. It burned away the rest of my words and probably saved my life. It was taken by one of you, and it will be in my jewelry box by eight tomorrow morning. If it shows up there, we'll ask no questions. I crossed my arms. What if it had been a burglar? Was she saying that if it had actually been one that she wouldn't believe me, her eldest daughter? My mother's disbelief in me was unforgivable. I wouldn't give it back, ever, just to show her. If it isn't in my jewelry box by that time, and neither of you will go outside to play until it comes back. Also, I'll return all your library books, and we won't go back for more until the ring is returned. There will be no reading. I gasped. I couldn't go without books. Not playing outside was fine. The main thing I did outside was read in the hammock anyway. But no books? One hand raised sharply, chopping the air in front of her face. Eight in the morning. I'll leave the box in here so whoever took it doesn't even have to go into our bedroom. She stood, her mouth set the way it looked when she was fighting off one of her migraines. Dad stood, too. 
He was only 29, younger than mom by five years, and he jammed his hands into his jeans pockets. He didn't want to lose his compatriots in the jungle of the backyard, his pals in shirked duties and playground hijinks. Come on, kids, just give it back. We'll pretend it never happened. I held the hot, furious tears in my chest, refusing to let them spill. When we were alone, Christy asked me if I'd stolen it. I was so irate that Mom wouldn't have believed me if it had been a burglar, which it totally could have been, that I could barely stand it. I didn't answer her. By then, I could almost remember what the burglar had looked like. A mask had covered his eyes like Zorro, and he'd worn, improbably, a black bowler. He'd been very, very handsome. He'd come into my room accidentally, and when I'd seen him, he'd just raised a finger to his lips and crept out quietly again with a cheeky wink. I told my sister about him, and she believed me. Hell, by that time, I believed myself. I'm protecting him, really. He did it so he could save the woman he loves. He has to buy her back from the king who's imprisoning her. I fell backward onto the beanbag. And Mom is going to ruin everything! Christy cried, imagining her lost playtime outside with the free field mice. I did the same beside myself at life's unfairness. I was upset at my mother, upset at the burglar, who now looked like the captain on the love boat in my mind and had changed his bowler for a snazzy white officer's hat, and most of all, I was upset with myself. Yes, I had lied. Now I understand that lie had made my brain more willing to be creative, even demanding it. The lie lit connectors in both hemispheres of my brain, birthing the cognitive flexibility to imagine the rest. The original lie made my subsequent lies easier to tell and easier to believe. This ring is mine. But deep down, I knew it was a lie, and I knew I'd have to return it. And worst of all, mom would know it was me. I put it back when my parents were drinking wine in the backyard. In the morning, the jewelry box was gone from the kitchen. I'd screwed it all up, but I could feel the power underneath what I'd done. A lie was just a start. It was a diving platform into storytelling. It was scary to be up there, waiting on the edge of the board, but once I got the bravery to speak the lie, the gorgeous story that unspooled as a result was as glorious as the jump. The appreciative gasp my audience made was the sound of breaking the water cleanly and sharply. Storytelling was what I was meant to do. I knew that, but it took bravery to tell a story. The only way I knew how to get that courage was through telling a lie. I didn't know the cognitive connection then, but I felt it. So, though I regret to admit this, I kept lying for the next 20 years. I was that girl, the fascinating one. I made up stories in the playground that I couldn't back up but made people listen and wonder. I was adopted. No, uh, my sister was adopted. I speak French. No, I speak German. Well, I can't say the words because I swore to my godmother I wouldn't. They're magic words. My memory was terrible even back then and I couldn't keep my story straight. Some kids thought I might be royalty, albeit distantly. Other kids thought I had PTSD from being kidnapped young. These two things were easy enough to conflate that I actually got away with it for a while. Some friends thought my parents grew and sold weed. They didn't even smoke it. And yet another group of friends thought I was a child laborer, forced by my parents to paint houses in 100-degree heat to subsidize the roof over my head. I'm not sure where I came up with that one. I'd never so much as helped paint a single wall. I didn't even really care what I lied about as long as I got to tell the subsequent story. Stories were so much more interesting than the truth. But as Anne Shirley says in Ellen Montgomery's Anne of Green Gables, the worst of imagining things is the time comes when you have to stop and that hurts. My lies tangled around each other, snarling like hair in a drain, but I wasn't brave enough to be truthful. I had to hide that I was desperately shy, that I was terrified of being laughed at, that I was convinced that if people knew the real me, they would hate me. It got worse as I cruised through adolescence. I lied to my classmates about my parents. I lied to my parents about my teachers. 
As a teenager, I got kicked out of the church I'd been attending when they found out the chronic, debilitating illness that had been keeping me away from service and that they'd been praying about was actually just good old Sunday morning laziness. In my early 20s, I got fired from a college bookstore when they called my other job and found out I didn't even work there. I kept lying anyway. I lied to the people I dated about not sleeping with other people. I lied to college classmates about why my parts of class assignments weren't done. I lied to coworkers about why I couldn't come in for my waitressing shifts. By the end of grad school, I was sick of it. I made myself ill, literally. I had constant bronchitis that went into pneumonia twice. I got pleurisy, which I thought only girls in 19th century books got, and the pain wasn't half as romantic as I thought it would be. I couldn't keep track of my lies, and the stress ate an ulcer in my stomach. And I couldn't write. The one thing I wanted to do, to write fiction that felt deep and true and authentic, was proving completely impossible. The more I lied to those I loved, the further I got from being someone who could call herself a writer. One cold night in May, I got home from a dinner service waitressing shift. My cat yowled at me. I'd forgotten to feed him again before I'd gone out. I couldn't even take care of Digit. What was I doing? Everyone was right about me. I pressed play on my answering machine and listened to a voicemail from someone I'd been avoiding, unable to turn myself into the person I'd pretended to be with him. He said, I dreamed I saw you walking away. I was okay with it. I'm letting you go. I can't take this anymore. Lying was a high that led to storytelling, the thing I felt born to do. Getting caught ruined everything around me. My finger still on the answering machine's delete button as my cat cursed me and I cursed myself, I changed. I would tell the truth about things no matter how hard it was to do. I couldn't afford the lies anymore. I broke up with my boyfriend, the one I'd lied to so many times. I broke up with the guy I was actually in love with, who wasn't my boyfriend. I started telling the truth to my friends and to my family. I'm depressed. I'm broke. I can't go to the movies because I can't afford the ticket. I'm sad. I'm lonely. I don't think I'll ever make it as a writer. I'm failing. I'm drowning. It turned out the truth was much easier to remember than the lies. When quizzed, my answers were always the same. Slowly, people started to trust me again. At one time, able to convince bus seatmates I was a Dutch potter on sabbatical, now when I lied, my face went red and I blinked too much. The only lie I allowed myself to keep was this one. I'm a writer. I knew I wasn't one. I could barely string sentences together. My ideas were garbled. My characters were stilted. But I said it anyway. I'm a writer. I said it in the morning on my way to my new dispatching job. I whispered it at night as I fell asleep. I'm a writer. It took all the bravery I had left to say it. I tried it out loud at a party for the first time, and my voice shook. I'm a writer? I felt my face blaze, and I quickly followed it up with the truth. And I'm also a 911 dispatcher. I expected the person to whom I was talking to latch on to the 911 thing. That was the interesting part, after all. But he asked about the lie. What do you write? Have I read anything by you? No, I stammered. I, I haven't published anything yet, but it's what I... I paused and dug my fingernails into my palm. But it's what I want to do most of all. That's amazing, he said. Good for you. The funny thing was this. When that was my only lie, I finally started writing. Cheryl Strayed, author of Wild, says, When you're speaking in the truest, most intimate voice about your life, you are speaking with the universal voice. The most authentic novels are the ones that, although they're fiction, feel real. While I was doing the wrong kind of lying, I couldn't tell the truth in fiction. My words fell flat. My writing didn't work. When I whispered to myself I was a writer, when I gave up the soul-crushing lies and said the right one out loud and gave it strength, I finally started to become what I wanted to be. Finally. Artists are often liars and thieves. Painters steal images. 
writers steal characters. There is nothing new under the sun, but I also know that every artist is completely, uniquely different. If another woman in another country with an identical background to mine is right now penning an essay with an identical thesis to this one, that a well-timed, well-intentioned lie begets bravery that can set a stuck artist in motion, I am completely confident we won't end with the same essay. We are each unique. And I'm certainly not saying that you're a liar or a thief. You're most likely a much better person than I'll ever be, and I'd also like your peanut butter cookie recipe, please. I am suggesting that if you're not living up to what you know is your creative potential, you might want to try a little fibbing to yourself. Mere survival isn't good enough. Yes, getting food on the table and keeping a roof over our heads comes first, but then it's vitally important to creative people that we aren't just worker bees. We all need to make something that couldn't exist without us. In many ways, this creating is not an acceptable desire. Society says to buckle down, go to work, raise your kids, watch TV in order to switch off at night. A hand-knitted sock is a waste of time. Have you seen how cheap they are at Walmart? But remember, a creative life is often lived outside the bounds of acceptability. On the day I graduated with my master's degree in creative writing, my family sat in the audience. Sweating in the May sun under my gown and hood, I gave the graduate address and I said something that I hoped was inspiring and was probably exactly like every other address being given all over the nation by other nervous graduates. I threw a party that night at my dank basement apartment. The black mold scrubbed off the walls for the occasion. My parents stayed through the whole thing, smiling gamely at the writer's tall tales, at the whoppers that got more obvious as the bourbon bottle emptied. Most people left, trailing behind them promises to keep in touch, to start that literary journal, to swap manuscripts. My mother helped me clean up the bottles and empty the ashtrays, and then she gave me a small box wrapped in white paper. In it was the ruby ring. I burst into tears. This ring is mine. You deserve it. This was high praise from my quiet mother. I knew she must not remember. But I stole this from you. I lied about it. I was the very last person in the whole world who could deserve this ring. I know. She gave me a quick hug and then ran up the wooden steps to the car where my father waited for her. You don't have time to draw a graphic novel. You can't just make up stories from nothing, out of nowhere. You think painting ceramics will make you famous or something? Crochet patterns won't feed a family of four. The people who talk to you like this probably know what's best for you. But they are not artists. Of course, live your life. Pay the bills. Do what's normal. Do what's sane. Do what works for you to keep yourself and the ones you love safe. And then go out on that limb. A harness dose of crazy in a workaday life can help you remember what magic feels like. Tell yourself a benevolent lie. Then make something that proves it's true. Want to get these recordings a whole month before anyone else? Do you want to get weekly texts from me nudging you to do your creative best? Well, you can for as little as $1 by supporting my Patreon at patreon.com backslash Rachel. That's spelled Rachel, R-A-C-H-A-E-L. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you.